Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think and to part two of a series of programmes looking at the first ever United Nations Climate Change Annual Report which was published in April 2018. The report looks at progress since the 2015 Paris Agreement and sets out the challenges and opportunities that we face as we move towards 2030 and beyond. In part one, I looked at the Paris Agreement itself and at the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. And you can have a look at that programme using that link there. So this week, I'm looking at what plans the United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change, or UNFCCC, has in place to help developing nations to adapt and cope with climate change. Turning to page 10 of the report, we hear from Robert Glasser, the United Nations Secretary General's Special Representative for Disaster Risk Reduction. He says, climate change, together with other megatrends, population growth, rapid urbanization, food insecurity, and water scarcity, increases competition for resources and heightens tensions and instability. If we do not address climate change, he goes on, we will not achieve the 2030 agenda. Moreover, keeping global temperatures well below the two degrees Celsius target is the greatest long-term contribution that governments, local governments, and the private sector can make to disaster risk reduction. In reality though, it's looking less and less likely that we're gonna stay within this two degrees Celsius target. We know that climate change hits the poorest people on the planet the hardest. They've got the least developed infrastructure to protect themselves in the first place. They often live subsistent lives either in coastal regions or rural areas, relying heavily on agriculture, livestock and fisheries, all of which is getting battered more and more as each year goes by. These folks also have the least amount of money to recover their communities and land after an extreme climate-driven disaster. Denying that climate change is real in the face of these events seems to me a bit like standing in a boat and declaring it's not sinking while water gently rises above your ankles. So as well as doing everything we can to reduce carbon emissions urgently, we also need to understand what's coming and devote our energies to adapting to a profoundly different world. And that brings us to three key UNFCCC initiatives. The Clean Development Mechanism, the National Adaptation Plans, and the Adaptation Fund. In her foreword, Patricia Espinoza, the UN Climate Change Executive Secretary, comments on the first of these three. She says, the work of the Clean Development Mechanism deserves a mention. Work under the mechanism, highlighted in this report, shows that actions to mitigate climate change bring many co-benefits in human health, green jobs, poverty reduction, and other aspects of development. In other words, they help developing countries who don't have emission reduction targets to achieve sustainable development while at the same time helping the rich industrial nations who do have emission targets to more easily achieve those targets by allowing them to purchase offsets created by these CDM projects. A crucial element of the initiative is something called additionality. And that means that any new infrastructure has to be over and above what would have happened anyway. It also has to be clearly demonstrated that any new project wouldn't have been viable without the CDM program. It's a noble concept born out of Kyoto, but there's been a lot of debate and controversy about whether each project is genuinely additional or whether it really would have happened without CDM support anyway. And in turn, this has brought allegations of corruption and collusion between state actors and funding administrators. And here's another issue. This graph shows that the majority of certified emission reduction credits are being generated in China, India and Brazil, not exactly tiny vulnerable countries. According to the Environmental Defense Fund, a US non-partisan group who advocate the use of sound science, economics and law to find market-based solutions to environmental problems, the corruption has become systemic. Brazil's biggest CDM player, the state power company called Eletrobras, told the CDM executive board that its Amazon mega hydroelectric dams needed CDM credit to attract investors. At the same time, it told investors that the dams were fully viable on their own. These dams are under investigation in the gigantic Brazil-wide corruption investigations nicknamed Lavo Yato, or Car Wash. They're also a prime exhibit in a lawsuit for fraud in US federal courts brought by investors in Electrobras stock. The UN emissions trading system no longer accepts CDM credits from Brazil, China or India. Now every system devised by human beings since the dawn of time has had an element of systemic corruption to a greater or lesser extent. They're all administered by human beings and there are good humans 
and bad humans. There are also affluent, comfortable humans and poor, desperate humans. So it's probably wise to be quite careful about the direction that we throw our criticism. We can all throw stones, but the objective surely has to be that the outcomes are positive ones at a local and global level. Which brings us nicely to national adaptation plans. Here's Cristiana Figueres speaking back in 2016 when she was UNFCCC Executive Secretary. Adaptation is the invitation that we're being given to change behaviours and um, consumption and production patterns that we have had for 100 and 150 years that are simply no longer sustainable. The National Adaptation Plan, or NAP, process helps countries conduct comprehensive medium and long-term climate adaptation planning. It's a flexible process that builds on each country's existing adaptation activities and helps integrate climate change into national decision making. To support the national adaptation plans, the UNFCCC Adaptation Fund was established to finance projects and programmes in developing countries that are particularly vulnerable to the adverse effects of climate change. This adaptation fund is largely financed by a 2% levy on certified emission reduction credits issued by the Clean Development Mechanism. Slightly worrying given what we've just learnt about, but anyway, here's how it works. Essentially, poor developing countries implement additional sustainability programmes and get certified emission reduction credits as a result. They then sell these credits to big rich industrial countries that have got loads of cash and they can use those credits to offset some of their carbon emissions and reach their targets. Alongside that, the UNFCCC takes a 2% cut of the CERs that are transferred from the developing countries to the rich countries. The UNFCCC is then able to recycle those funds via the adaptation fund back towards the developing countries to help them implement infrastructure and contingency plans to protect them against future climate change problems. Despite the controversy and debate, the National Adaptation Plan and the Adaptation Fund do appear to be globally welcomed as genuine, positive and effective initiatives that deliver real change on the ground in the affected regions. The report cites Nepal as a great example of a National Adaptation Plan in action. Here's their summary on page 24. Nepal is an example of a country that has taken advantage of the Convention's adaptation architecture to build strong national systems for adaptation. In 2010, this mountainous, least developed country whose primary climate change risk is from flooding caused by glacial melt and intense rainfall, developed a national program of action on adaptation to address urgent and immediate needs in most vulnerable communities. This program was followed a year later by a national policy that directs at least 80% of climate finance to community level activities and setting up of a national program to support implementation of the National Adaptation Plan. A crucial element of any adaptation plan is how agriculture will be integrated. Rising temperatures around the world will transform the suitability of local environments and soils for growing particular crops. Nations will need to understand this and adapt their crop selection and seeding to ensure they adapt to these changes. And it's not just far away countries with poor infrastructure that are embracing national adaptation plans. Here's the US plan and a similar document from Canada. We've got one too. Here it is. And it's been costed and factored into our national budgets. Here's that document as well. We've also got a comprehensive National Infrastructure Commission report outlining the major changes we'll need to embrace in the coming years. This was all set up some years ago by the coalition government. They had sight of all the scientific data in much greater detail than we ever did and they've known perfectly well for a long time that the planet faces irreversible changes to the climate. This is Kevin Anderson, Professor of Energy and Climate Change and Deputy Head of the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research, interviewed back in 2016. Even somewhere like the UK, which may be more insulated from some of the impacts um, of climate change, will actually, from the direct impacts in terms of our weather here in the UK, how that will play out, actually will still be impacted by how, how, how the weather and the climate plays out elsewhere in the world. So that will significantly affect things like food prices, fuel prices, um, you know, the whole process of globalisation will be impacted by a change in climate. But climate change really doesn't form part of our national conversation just at the moment. 
Here's Professor Peter Cox of the University of Exeter, again speaking in 2016. And generally what happens is every time there's a new flood, there's a resurgence of interest in climate change, but it sort of fades away. I mean, environmental change is the long-term issue that we have to solve, and we can't keep saying, drop it down and out. You know, we've got to start to paint pictures of the future for people that they can choose between. Climate change is a great big messy problem involving 7.6 billion people and counting, and there's no black and white simple solution. In the final part of this mini-series, I'll be looking at the remaining technical, environmental and social initiatives reviewed in the United Nations report, including the reduction of deforestation and the crucial Gender Action Plan. Until then, as ever, thanks very much for watching, have a great week, and remember to just have a think. See you in part three.